Welcome to the Ford School. It is lovely to see uh, so many people here uh, for this wonderful event today. So we have some people on the floor. There are still like spots of seats around. If you want to um, help yourself to a seat, please feel free to do that. Um, I'm Michael Barr. I'm the Joan and Sandy Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. It's my pleasure um, to be here with you this afternoon and to welcome you to the Ford School for this Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Um, Day event. Um, I hope that uh, many of you arrived in time uh, to enjoy lunch and to view the wonderful exhibit in the Great Hall. Uh, the exhibit uh, opened last week and will stay up here at the Ford School through the end of this month. It's the photo documentary work of Denver-based artist and emerging lens winner Rachel Wolf, and it's accompanied by contextual information about immigration that was created uh, in conjunction with Ann Lynn and Fabiana Silver uh, here at the Ford School and Stamps Professor Hanna Smotrich at uh, the Stamp School of Art and Design. The exhibit chronicles the experiences of longtime Ann Arbor residents Lourdes Salatar Batista and her family. Many in our community know and are part of the story of the Salazar family. And I know that for Lourdes's family and friends, uh, many of whom uh, are here today, the photographs and what we'll explore at today's panel are deeply personal. It's their story and it belongs to them. And yet we're at a moment in American history when our attention is riveted by what is unfolding along our shared border with Mexico, in the halls of power in Washington, D.C., in our public spaces, including at the Lincoln Memorial itself, and in towns and cities all across the United States. <coughs> Immigration, the rising flow of refugees from countries afflicted by violence and poverty, are definitions of insider and outsider. Those issues represent many thousands of individual stories, and they are also public policy challenges. They represent policy issues and decisions that's, that really, in many ways, slice straight to the core of what America is what America dreams it might be. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. King wrote that, quote, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And so I'm deeply grateful to the Salazar family for opening their lives to Rachel and her camera. Their story and those of thousands of others separated from their families, living in fear, living in isolation, hoping for a better life for their children, those stories are in a very real sense also the story of all of us in this room. They're about who we are as citizens or immigrants or the children of immigrants, who we vote into office, what we believe about this country, what we try to build that it will be. I'm grateful for the opportunity today to engage both with the Salazar family's experiences and with the many broad policy issues around immigration and deportation, issues that it is our responsibility to understand and to grapple with. Our guests' full biographies are printed in your program. We've gathered a terrific group of perspectives. I want to thank the Ford School's diversity, equity, and inclusion lead, Stephanie Sanders, for her work in organizing today's event. Thank you, Stephanie, who's sitting in the back. <clears throat> Let me just take a moment to greet uh, each of our speakers. Emilio Gutierrez Soto is a Mexican journalist and asylum seeker who is here in Ann Arbor as part of the prestigious Knight Wallace Fellowship Program. Hiko Gomez is our interpreter. William Lopez is clinical faculty at Michigan School of Public Health and faculty director of public scholarship at the NCID. Laura Sanders is the co-founder of the Washtenaw Interfaith Coalition for Immigrant Rights and a longtime lecturer in the School of Social Work. Rachel Wolf, who I mentioned before, is an award-winning visual journalist and photographer whose work shows aspects of humanity intersecting with economic and social issues. We have a very special guest in the middle of our panel, uh, Lourdes's daughter, uh, also known as Lourdes, who is a community high school student uh, here in Ann Arbor. And finally, our host for today's event, my colleague, Professor Ann Lynn, 
who is an expert on immigration and immigration policy. Welcome to all of you, and thank you all very much for being here. Let me just say uh, one word on our format before getting things started. We'll have some time towards the end for questions from the audience. Ford School professor Fabiana Silver and two Ford School students, Jonathan Espiniza and Yvonne Navarrete, will sift through your question cards and pose them to the panel. For those watching online, please tweet your questions using the hashtag policytalks. And with that, let me turn things over to Ann Lynn. Thank you all for showing up on such a snowy and cold um, January day. Um, it's a great honor to be asked to moderate this panel and to do so on a day that we dedicate to remembering uh, Martin Luther King and the lives he affected here and also the work and the ideals that he stands for. I want to start off the panel today, so we're hoping to make this panel as much of a conversation as we possibly can. Um, and I want to start off today by asking Lourdes if you would say a little bit about um, what the most important thing you think people should take from your and your family's story might be. Okay. <clears throat> well, hi, my name is Lourdes. Um, uh, I just want to say that first, thank you for everyone that came here and took their time out of their day to come. Um, to this panel, and not to answer um, Anne's question, um, I would really want to say that, or like show everyone that this is a real situation that does happen, that um, millions of people um, all over this, or in this country have been through or are going through this. Um, and I just really want to, you know, put some light into it and share it to as many people as I can um, because there's a lot of people who, you know, stay silent and don't say anything and then like when the event happens and then later on they'll regret like not doing anything and not saying anything um, and yeah. So I just really want to um, show everyone that this is, this is real and it does happen and yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lourdes. Um, Laura, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the Washtenaw, um, inter the Washtenaw Immigrant Rights, in in sorry, Washtenaw That's Interfaith okay. Coalition for Immigrant sure. Rights, or Wicker, and then how you and the coalition first got in touch with Lourdes about her case. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I am a co-founder of the Washtenaw Interfaith Coalition for Immigrant Rights, along with a number of other people. Um, we came together in response to a crisis in 2008 in our community where Immigration and Customs Enforcement came into a mobile home community and raided it and took out about 21 undocumented workers, leaving a lot of families um, torn apart. Uh, there's a lot of story to that. The, uh, the way in which ICE came into um, this community was brutal. They, they busted into uh, trailers, they um, handcuffed and uh, threw people on the floor. Um, they were supported and aided by local police. Um, so it was a real tragedy. It was a big crisis in our community. And Ramiro, my spouse, who's here, Ramiro Martinez, and um, Melanie uh, Harner, who's also here, um, are uh, both original co-founders. Um, what happened was that Melanie was living in that community at the time and got in touch with us and her mother, and we had been working on some different things together um, having to do with immigrant rights. And we decided to call together a major meeting you know, old-fashioned community organizing style. I went into uh, my community. I'm a social worker. I'm a therapist. I'm a feminist. I'm on the LGBTQ, LGBTQ spectrum. So I've been done activism in this community for a long time. So I went into my community and pulled as many people. Uh, Melanie and Margaret, her mother, went into their community. They're very uh, uh, rooted in the faith community, brought in many, many different people from different faiths. We also had a lot of people uh, from academic organizations, peace and justice organizations, show up at that meeting. 
and um, we had about 50 people who responded to that original crisis. Uh, so we pulled together by, by the next Saturday, which was the night before Easter, we had 150 people at our meeting, and that was really the birth of the Washtenaw Interfaith Coalition for Immigrant Rights. Um, it's always been important to us to elevate the voices of un the undocumented community, and the first thing that people said they really needed was a telephone where they could call if something, if detainment or de if they were at risk of detainment or deportation. And so we set that up, and um, ever since, so since 2008, we have carried a phone. And we now have hundreds of volunteers, many people have made donations, have uh, attended Wicker events, and we have a, an amazing team of people that have helped with campaigns to stop people's deportations and just meeting the needs of the immigrant community. In fact, if I could just take a second, I'd like anybody who's had anything to do with Wicker at any time, stand up. Please, please, anybody who's had anything to do with Wicker, stand up. Thank you. So you can see that um, it, is, it is a community uh, uh, um, organization. The way that we got in touch with Lourdes is Lourdes was um, uh, detained and put in jail for 23 days in 2010. She was apprehended in front of her children as they were going to school. Um, she was she was as I said she was detained for 23 days and immigration made some very bizarre trade where um, instead of deporting Lourdes, they deported her husband. So they traded her off and they deported Luis, her husband, um, in, in that, the end of the summer of 2010. When Lourdes was released, she came to, at the time, um, we were, Ramiro and I were living in um, Ann Arbor and she heard about Wicker and, you know, we were just two years old at that time. She came to our door and we interviewed her in our kitchen. And it was a long uh, conversation, and, and we um, asked her what she needs. That's the way we operate in Wicker. We try to get in touch with what do people need. And she wanted us to help her stop her deportation. And, but she had to make a decision as whether she was going to go public. And it was a really, really hard decision for her. By the end of that meeting, we were taking pictures of her holding a sign saying, I am not a criminal. And she was starting to get ready to um, make a public campaign to stop her deportation. At the time, she was very, very scared. And I'll tell you, the Lourdes Salazar Bautista that I know today is a wonderfully empowered person, and so are her young daughters, uh, Pamela and Lourdes. And we're just thrilled to have uh, their two voices still here, um, able to speak for their family. But um, what we did is we decided that we were going to try to stop her deportation, and there was a whole group of people that got involved, uh, many, many volunteers, and we did everything we possibly could. We made calls to ICE, we put out a, a petition online, we had, um, we had uh, letters from principals and the and city council, we went to city council, we got resolutions passed on her behalf, I mean, we just, uh, we, we went to all the churches, everybody from churches, we, we did phone marathons, we had vigils, we had a march. Um, we just pulled in as many um, people. We, we really launched, and it was our first time doing that, we launched a, a national campaign on behalf of Lourdes. And the day before she was supposed to be, because they still were going to deport her, even though they traded off her husband, they were still going to deport her. And her, she was supposed to be deported like on Christmas Eve of that year. And the day before, we got notification that we were, they were going to temporarily stop her deportation, acknowledge what is called a stay of removal um, at ICE. And so she was, yeah, obviously we were thrilled. We tried to find out what what worked in terms of stopping her deportation. And the word from Washington was that we threw so many pancakes against the wall that something stuck. But nobody, they didn't want us to know exactly what stuck. So fast forward five years, every year we had to uh, put a, another um, letter 
of request for a stay of deportation. And as long as Obama was in office um, and he had certain priorities in place where Lourdes and her family were not in the priority for deportation group, um, we were able to get her deportation uh, it, she was living in limbo. She didn't have a pathway to citizenship or anything, but we were able to get her deportation stopped for five years. And as soon as Trump came in, they were once again warning her that she was going to be deported. And another campaign was launched. Uh, Luz is here, Maria Ibarra is here, people who were very, very active in her, um, in the second wave really of trying to stop Lourdes's deportation and we did the same thing a huge campaign um, and uh, but they they de they deported her anyway my own feeling is that um, Lourdes's case had become very famous they're deporting almost everyone now the the priorities that President Obama had put into place have been have been um, trashed basically and I think that they were letting us know that, um, you know, they were going to deport Lourdes and they were going to, and it was an example, it, it had an example of what they're doing now, which is nobody, nobody is safe really from deportation. So that's really how um, Wicker has been involved. Thanks so much, Laura. Mm -hmm. Rachel, I'm wondering if you can add to the conversation and just tell us a little bit about how you got involved with this case. Sure. Yeah, so I, I met Lourdes when she was later on in her campaign, as Laura mentioned, the second big campaign that she did in 2017. And it was around that time when she reached out to, I think her campaign was reaching out to try to find people to tell her story. And that was basically how I met Lourdes, through a friend of a friend um, that reached out and said that, hey, these people are looking to get her story out. Um, and then I went over to her house and met Luli's and the family, and we connected and talked, and I explained um, my, what I do, and we just started from there. Um, and so then I stuck with her and uh, documented all that she was going through in those weeks, and then she was deported on August 1st in 2017, um, and then I went back to Mexico uh, two times after that. So what my... Um, what I hope to do is try to show this family in a way that shows their dignity and shows their strength because as Laura mentioned, Lourdes is still fighting and has fought so, so hard and as is all of her family. Um, and so I got involved to try to um, help in whichever way I could um, as a photojournalist and documentarian. So, yeah. Um, Thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. um, Lourdes's story, of course, is only one of many stories, many people around um, the United States who have found that they're, <clears throat> despite the fact that they've lived in the U.S. for a long time, despite the fact that they may have children who are U.S. citizens, um, that they are going to be deported. Um, and Bill Lopez, I'm, Bill, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the sort of larger context of this. You've been active with the immigrant community here um, in Washtenaw County, and you've also spoken to both um, immigrants, their act activists, but also law enforcement um, about the process of deportation. So I'm wondering if you can say, tell us about that. Sure. You know, I think it's important to remember that these, these stories are certainly unique uh, and they involve unique lives and people in particular contexts, but they also teach us a lot about what immigration looks like throughout the country. And I think in, in, this, in this case, uh, often in the Midwest, so in the Midwest it looks a little bit different than border enforcement on the south, for example, on the southern border, uh, where you see border patrol driving around and people's, um, you know, people come in contact with the immigration system because of, DH because of DHS and because of border patrol. Here, it's very often because of police collaboration with immigration and customs enforcement that folks will end up in these systems. Um, you know, and I, th I think one of the things that we can think about in this particular case, and it's very clear, uh, we often on the national scale think about and count deportations um, and take that as a measure of what immigration enforcement looks like. What we can see is that everyone who's deported is generally connected to a family. And every one of those families is generally connected to a community. And here we saw a strong family both in the original deportation of Lourdes' husband and later um, in Lourdes' deportation. We see the impacts for children, for husbands, for wives, and then we see the impacts on communities um, and the way communities come together after these, after these events. 
Is there anything in particular, Bill, that strikes you about how the immigrant community in Washtenaw County has evolved over the last few years? Sure. I, I feel, you know, I certainly feel lucky. I've been, I've been um, able to work as both a researcher and an advocate thanks to uh, Wicker allowing me to work alongside them many times. And I see um, the people in the room uh, who allowed that, that work to happen, that collaboration to happen. There's, there's a few things that I'm really proud of in our county. And one is that Wicker has been very creative in their collaboration with the university. Um, there was, following the, you know, Laura mentioned the raid in 2008. There was also a, a big raid in, in 2013. Um, and we collaborated with Wicker. We interviewed the folks in the raid, both here and those deported. Um, and we wrote some academic pieces about these. And these are the only academic pieces that exist um, about immigration raids, because as you can imagine, these are, are challenging things to study for a number of reasons. Uh, there's also a book that will be coming out about that raid um, in the future, and that is all because of um, specifically Melanie and Ramiro um, supporting the work of uh, supporting that work. Um, the other thing I think that that Wicker has done is that there's uh, we've been we've been forced to rather be creative in the way that we've supported our community. So we operated the urgent response line for quite a while and I've seen many distinct pivots. Um, originally I would say there were years when it was providing like, yes, we can help you get in contact with a lawyer. Then I'd say there were years where it was, yes, we can help you apply for college scholarships because DACA came out. Um, and then there was a while we were focusing on anti-deportation uh, campaigns, right? So our goal is to stop the deportation. And the latest pivot and the one that I think is the most challenging but also the one I'm most proud of is, is what does it mean to win and to lose deportation cases now? Um, we can no longer count. We can no longer seek only to win anti-deportation cases. We have to think deeper. We have to think about how to support families no matter what the end result is. Uh, whether it's deportation or whether the individual stays. Uh, we have to speak with teachers about whether these kids have counseling and kids can continue eating. Uh, we have to find jobs and employment uh, for folks because these cases are expensive. So I've been able to see the immigrant and the mixed status, I call our, our community a mixed status community, grow in the way that we think about supporting folks and, and grow in the way that we think about the impact of immigration enforcement. Thank you so much. Um, I want to turn to Emilio Gutierrez Soto for a second. Um, and Emilio, you're here in two, um, in, in two identities. One, um, as a Mexican journalist, somebody who understands the immigration issue from the Mexico side. And then also somebody who has applied for political asylum to the United States. Um, and who during that process has faced a long series of delays um, and also for a while detention. So at, the, so at first what I'm just going to ask you to do is to start from the hat that you wear of the Mexican journalist. And if you can tell us something about the, the impact of these um, American immigrants who have been deported to Mexico or who are now leaving the U.S. because they're fearful of deportation. Sí, mire, este, los connacionales que son regresados a México. The Mexicans that are returned to Mexico. Muchos de ellos han hecho su vida en Estados Unidos. Many of them have made their lives in the United States. Y llegan totalmente desintegrados. Muchos de ellos ni siquiera hablan español. And they arrive into Mexico completely unintegrated. Many of them don't even speak Spanish. Y así como vivieron en este país en un limbo, llegan a México en otro limbo. And just, and just like you said earlier, they live in this country in limbo, but they arrive in Mexico and they, are, they just find themselves in a different limbo. Y más crítico porque hay más pobreza which is even more critical because there, there is more poverty. Actualmente no puedes acceder muy fácil a una educación de mayor calidad. Currently, they could not access a better quality education. Y es la pared con la que se tienen que enfrentar todos los nuevos inmigrantes en México. And that is the wall they have to face or that they encounter when they arrive back into Mexico porque realmente se convierten en inmigrantes de su propia patria. Because they become immigrants in their own country. 
los... Y a mí me tocó conocer a varias personas antes de ingresar a Estados Unidos. I have met several people before I came into the United States. Deportados. That were, had been deported. Y es, es muy lamentable verlos que no se pueden expresar, que no se pueden, que no pueden tener ese contacto directo con la comunidad, porque no conocen el idioma y no conocen ni la cultura. And it is very sad to see how can they not express themselves or they have, how can they not make real contact with the community or with the society because they don't understand the culture. Many times they don't even speak the language. Muchos de ellos sin familia o Ma con familiares lejanos. Many of them without a family or with very remote relatives. Y es, es al menos en mi caso, a, a mí me, pare, me parecía lamentable observarlos. For me, it was very sad to observe that. Thank you. Um, Emilio, as we said earlier, you are um, also an asylum seeker to the United States. Um, there is a story today in Politico um, that Emilio um, wrote, which is about his case, and the story is called I'm Safe But I'm Not Free. And so I encourage you to look at that story later on if you would like to know some of some more details about um, his asylum case. But um, today I'm wondering, Emilio, if you would just um, talk a little bit about why you asked for political asylum in the U.S. And then what has happened since you requested asylum? Yo solicité asilo político en los Estados Unidos en el 2008. I requested a political asylum in the United States in 2008. Después de que el presidente Calderón en México inició una guerra contra las drogas. After the Mexican president, Mr. Calderón, initiated or started a war against drugs. Y que motivó a los soldados a estar en las calles. And that created or caused that the soldiers were on the streets. A raíz de que los soldados salen a las calles es cuando se incrementa la violencia a nivel nacional. As a result of the soldiers being on the streets, that's when the violence was uh, increased and in the national level. Apagaron el fuego con gasolina. They tried to put out a fire with gasoline. Y en previo al 2008 yo tuve amenazas con, por parte del ejército. Prior to 2008, I was threatened by the army. Y en el 2008 se empezaron a dar los con mayor frecuencia los homicidios contra periodistas y activistas de derechos humanos. In 2008, that was when the homicides against newspaper people or reporters uh, started a be, or, or became greater. Cuando me percato de la vigilancia muy cercana por parte de militares hacia mi persona, hacia mi familia. When I start noticing that the militaries were taking uh, more interest on myself as an individual and as a family. Decido esconderme ese día en la casa de un amigo, pero en la noche otra persona me habla y me dice, te van a matar. That very same day I decided to hide in a friend's house. However, that same night, that very night, somebody called me on the phone and told me, they're going to kill you. Le pregunto que si cómo sabe. Me I, dice, I asked him how he knew this. Y me dice, tengo un familiar dentro del equipo del ejército que viene a matarte. And he tells me, I have a relative that is within the army's team that is coming to kill you. En ese instante fue una decisión de rayo. At that moment, I took an instant decision. Tomé a mi hijo y la misma amiga que me avisó me llevó a un rancho para escondernos, para escondernos. I took my son and the very same friend that let me know about the problem, she took, me, she took us to a ranch, to a farm, so that we could hide. No tenía otra puerta más que la de Estados Unidos. There was no other door except the one into the United States. Y la decisión fue llegar al puerto de entrada de Antelope, Antelope Wells en Nuevo México y pedir asilo político. And the decision was to come to the entry port of Anti Wells, New Mexico and request political asylum. Nos arrestaron. We were arrested. Y al par de días nos separaron. Nos qué? Nos separaron. And a couple of days later, we were separated. 
Conozco ese tema muy bien. I know the subject very, very well. La separación de familias, las lamentables separaciones criminales de familias. The painful criminal separation of families. Siete meses y medio estuve encerrado yo en, en un campo de concentración de esos que tiene la ICE. ¿Siete meses? Siete meses y medio. Seven and a half months, I was kept captive in one of those concentration camps that ISIS uh, has. Mi hijo estuvo bajo arresto dos meses y medio. My son was under arrest for two and a half months. Y en ese tiempo yo tuve la oportunidad de hablar con él tres ocasiones. And during that time I only had the occasion or the opportunity to speak with him for three times. Por cinco minutos cada vez. For five minutes each time. Ustedes se pueden imaginar la forma en que destruyen las vidas de los niños y de los adolescentes por políticas criminales. Maybe you can understand the way they destroy kids and adolescents' lives because of criminal polit politics. En esos centros de detención o campos de concentración. In those se attention centers, which I call concentration camps. Lo que menos existe es un trato humano. What is in least existence is a human treatment. El que no está enfermo, se enferma. If you're not sick, you will get sick. Y los oficiales, muchos en su mayoría, sin educación media. And the officers, many of them with, without even a middle level education. Se encargan de ser los verdugos de los inmigrantes bajo arresto. Are in charge of being rude to the immigrants under arrest. Malas comidas. Bad food. Mal sueño. Poor co sleeping conditions. El estrés que se genera al tener que convivir con 100 personas más encerradas en el mismo cuarto. The stress generated for, ha for having to live with 100 people in the same room. El acoso de esos oficiales que hacen el trabajo sucio de ICE. The, uh, the stalking or, or the stress from those officials that are doing the dirty work for ICE. Son parte nada más todo esto de las intenciones que se adjudican al tratar de aplicar leyes de inmigración. All these are just the results that are created by trying to apply the immigration laws. Que están, que forman parte de una política internacional que se dice humanista. That are part of international policies that are referred to as humanistic. Algo que está ausente en las políticas de inmigración de este país. But that is something that does not exist in the immigration policies of this country. Y muchas personas se espantan cuando les dice uno esto. Many people are surprised or scared when I mention that. Pero la inmigración que llega a este país, But the immigrants that arrive into this country, de México, Centro y Sudamérica, son parte del fenómeno que se creó con la pobreza que se llevó a esas naciones. But the immigrants that arrive into this country from Mexico, Central America, or other countries are part or are a result of the poverty that was created or caused within those countries. Y es donde nos corresponde el trabajo a mí como periodista. And that's where our work, myself as a news reporter, ser crítico en eso. To be critical about that. Y conjuntamente con la sociedad buscar contar con la disposición de ser más humanos en nuestro trato con nuestros hermanos inmigrantes. And that is my work, in conjunction or in association with the communities and with the people of this, this country, to work together, to be more brotherly to, to our, and more fair to our immigrants, brothers and sisters. Nadie queremos salir de nuestro entorno, de nuestro país. No one. No one wants to leave their own country, their own uh, society. Unos salimos por hambre. 
Some of us leave. Some leave because they're hungry. Otros por violencia. Some because of violence. Pero finalmente nos encontramos en la búsqueda en la búsqueda de la libertad. But at the end, we're all looking for liberty. En diez años y medio que tenemos mi hijo y yo en este lado. My son and I have been here for ten and a half years on this side. Solicitando asilo político. Requesting political asylum. Lo que menos hemos tenido es la libertad. The thing that we lack the most is freedom. Tenemos seguridad. We have safety. Pero no libertad. But we do not have freedom. Nuestro caso de asilo político ha sido muestra para otros más que ya se resolvieron favorablemente. Our case has been used as a sample for other cases which have been res resolved in a favor, which have had a favorable result. Eso me causa alegría y satisfacción. That causes happiness and satisfaction for my, for, to me. Pero también me da tristeza de que nuestro caso de ser un asunto legal se tornó a un asunto personal con el juez de inmigración. But it also makes me very, very sad that my case, our particular case, became from being a immigration case, it became a political ca a personal case with the immigration judge. Por eso digo que las políticas de inmigración se aplican prácticamente de acuerdo al estado de sensibilidad que se encuentre el juez o que se encuentre el fiscal o que se encuentre el, el oficial de inmigración. And that's why I keep on saying that the immigration policies sometimes are applied based on the mood or the personal feeling of the judge or, or the attorneys or even the officers. Finalmente, las leyes de inmigración de poco sirve. And finally, therefore, immigration laws become useless. Y yo subí un ejemplo de ello en 10 años y medio solicitando asilo político. And I myself have become a personal example of that, that I've been requesting political asylum for 10 and a half years. Gracias. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much for your story, Emilio. Mm. Gracias. Um, Gracias por tu historia. I want to um, remind you all that um, if you would like to ask questions of anybody on the panel, um, Ford School staff are walking around with questions, cards, question slips. Please feel free to request a slip and write your question and we will get it sent down to be read. Um, I also want to introduce briefly um, the people who will be handling questions today. Um, professor Fabiana Silva, who is an assistant professor here here at the Ford School of Public Policy. Um, Yvonne Navarrete, who is our a junior here in public policy at the Ford School, and Jonathan Espinoza, who is a first year Masters of Public Policy student. Um, we, I'd, I'd like to start getting the questions in so we can have more of a conversation. So do you have a question ready for us? Hello everyone, um, my name is Yvonne Navarrete. I'm a senior at the BA program of the Ford School of Public Policy. And as an undocumented student and immigrant rights advocate, I value everyone here today. Um, we have a question here about the political power of groups. So as noted in the MLK keynote session, immigration policy is a reflection of the political power of groups. Why have those supporting deportation gained power? And how do we shift power to those who welcome immigrants? Okay. So why have the why have the people who the groups that have supported deportation gained power? And how does that shift? Is that the question? Great. Um, would somebody on the panel like to address that? I'm happy to to make a statement about it. I'm not an expert on it, but um, we know that. Uh, since nine, there wasn't really a Department of Homeland Security until 9-11. And um, after 9-11, uh, we put the Department of Homeland Security in place. It's a law enforcement agency. And we put immigration, the uh, processing of, immigra of immigration applications under now a law enforcement department. We also put a lot of money into it. 
um, and all in the name of you know trying to keep the country safe from terrorism. Uh, the United States it has the largest land border in, in the world between a highly developed country and a developing country. So you know that you're going to have cross migration, right? There's, there's always been international cross migration. There's always been undocumented immigrants here in the United States coming and making money, going home and, you know, buying a truck, going home, making, making, uh, building houses, you know, this kind of cross migration that we didn't really pay a lot of attention to until after 9-11. Uh, and it, it's uh, our impression, and there's a lot of uh, research that supports that, you know, the undocumented Mexican and, and uh, Central American and South American uh, communities have been scapegoated by uh, the intentions of uh, the immigration um, of, of the Department of Homeland Security. And very, very much it's a racist uh, war. Um, it's a racist uh, agenda because there's a lot of uh, people who are very concerned about what you would we would consider the browning of America, right? More and more people from uh, the, the South America and Central America coming. And it, it, it set up a perfect forum, really, for those people to, uh, to gain and keep gaining power. That's what I have to say. I'm sure there's more to it. <laughs> sure. I think one of the things I can, I can add to that is it's important to understand the way in which these different struggles of marginalized communities uh, can and, and should be linked in our advocacy efforts, right? Uh, an uh, example that I think of recently is we think of the tear gas shot across the U.S. border into Mexico. And I think of the tear gas shot at the protesters of uh, Standing Rock. And I think of the tear gas shot uh, by officers in Ferguson, Missouri. And these are three different marginalized communities, right? We think of undocumented immigrants, we think of immigrants crossing the borders in our Latino communities and our Mexican uh, family in this case. Um, we think of protesters in Ferguson protesting police violence and state-sanctioned killings of African Americans. And then we think of water protectors who are protesting, uh, the, protesting making a profit off of our resources, right? Um, these are the same communities fighting the same state-sanctioned violence and militarization, but we often divide them in our advocacy. We often think of which particular policy am I going to work against, instead of thinking about how we can unify, um, you know, along the lines of dignity for people from multiple marginalized groups. Okay, we have, uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Espinoza, and as, as Anne said, I am a first year uh, Master's of Public Policy, Policy student here at the Ford School, and we have a question from the audience. Um, I would like to understand more about immigration law. Are immigration lawyers effective? Do they have their client's best interest in mind? How much influence does a good or bad lawyer have in the verdict of an immigrant's case? So I'm going to take that to start out with and then see if somebody wants to add it. Um, <clears throat> so immigration lawyers um, do really invaluable work in interpreting what is often a very complicated set of laws, not only laws about what happens if you are undocumented in the U.S. and are arrested, do you have rights, can you ask for permission to stay in the U.S., but also the very complicated series of laws that are about how someone enters legally into the U.S. Um, our president often says that you know people should come to the U.S. the right way, and I think many people would agree with him. But it's very hard. It's but people often don't realize that there is no one right way to come to the U.S. It is not as easy as filling out an application and waiting for your turn in line. That we have many different categories of people, many different categories of visas. Some of those have long waiting lists. Some of those are only applicable to people with certain types of skills or particular family members in the U.S. Um, and so it is very possible that somebody who wants to come to the U.S. to work, to make a living, and to have a better life 
will find no category of visa available to them. Those will not be able to come to the U.S. legally with a visa. Um, it's not because of something they didn't do. It's because of the kinds of categories that we have created um, for admission to the United States. And so immigration lawyers are often extremely helpful in helping people sort of think about what their options are in arriving in the U.S. They're also extremely helpful on the back end, which is what happens if somebody is has, if somebody is at risk of deportation. Um, one of the really important issues here is when we look at people who are claiming asylum. So people who are like Emilio who have been requesting um, safety in the U.S. And what we will find is that if you have an immigration lawyer, you are more than 100 percent more likely to have a favorable, not a favorable, not just a favorable um, answer to your asylum case, not, not just allowing you to have a, asylum, but actually even getting through the stages of the asylum process. That is, lawyers are extremely helpful when you go from the initial immigration um, appointment with an immigration, with an asylum officer, to then appearing before an immigration judge, if you get a negative answer, to then appealing to a board of appeals. Um, and our system does not guarantee lawyers to people who come who are asking for them for asylum cases. Our system does not guarantee lawyers to people who are fighting a deportation case. And because of that, the lawyers that are available to people are very often um, lawyers that have focused on these cases um, and are willing to work with people who don't have a lot of money, um, or pro bono lawyers, lawyers who may not even specialize in immigration law, but are willing to take a particular case without pay. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add to that. On the, yeah. uh, I just wanted to say on the local level, um, we uh, at Wicker, we have um, developed relationships with lawyers that we trust. There's good immigration lawyers and there's really bad immigration lawyers. And Lourdes' case is a perfect example of, of that. Um, her, her, the lawyer that she was originally working with who arranged this, this um, interesting trade between her husband and her um, was at, at, um, at the end charging her $20,000, um, having her clean her house, having her bring her tamales, having her clean her mother's house. And we switched out. We made sure that she got a new lawyer. And so we got, um, and so this is a really good example of, you know, sometimes we have to really help people to get the right kind of legal help. And then my only other comment is back in the bigger picture, you know, there are incredible pushes and pulls to immigrate, to undocumented and um, uh, immigration coming across our border. And we are, a lot of times what we don't think about is the root causes of the, the immigration issues. Uh, the U.S., with our economic policies and our policies on weapons and trade, we have created a lot of the poverty that's in the South American countries and Central American countries that create the push for people to come over our border. And at Wicker, we think very globally, but we work very locally. So we think a lot about the fact that um, the U.S. Um, is involved in creating this problem. And we think that people of good faith, when we understand that we're responsible for something, will take action and make and, and correct those policies. Thank you. Um, do we have another question? Adding to that, what options are available for families that have been separated due to deportation? How do families deal with this challenge? Realmente no existe para los personas deportadas no existen muchas oportunidades al regresar al país. In reality, for people that have been deported, there is no opportunities once you have been returned or sent back to your country. Por ejemplo, algún deportado que cruce por Ciudad Juárez, as El Paso, Ciudad Juárez. As an example, a person that has been deported and it crosses from El Paso to Ciudad Juárez. Probablemente tenga la oportunidad de llegar a la casa del inmigrante y probablemente pueda tener un boleto de autobús para llegar a su pueblo. 
maybe he or she will have a bus ticket, ticket to arrive to his town. Pero cuando llegas a tu pueblo, llegas otra vez desnudo. But once you arrive into your town, you arrive there naked. Sin oportunidades. Without any opportunities. Um, I would like to follow up on that. Uh, for my family's case, um, we were really grateful that um, once we land to Mexico, we are um, uh, this one team um, who was recommended by someone from here. Or so when we were still here, uh, we met an incredible man in Detroit who helped us um, settle in in Mexico. So literally once we landed and we were still in the airport, we were taken to this um, to this one uh, room and my mom was instantly interviewed and um, and, and after that, they um, took us to my mom and my dad's um, ranch, so like where they're originally from. And that's when we like, you know, settled in um, in my grandma's house and all that. And then um, that week, they, they basically like, took us in and like showed us Mexico. They showed us, or they took us to this city named Toluca in Mexico, who where um, my mom, my younger brother, and my dad live right now. Um, and there, we um, they give us a, an amazing house, a little house to live in, and they gave uh, me, my brother, and my older sister um, an opportunity to stud to study there, but. Um, my sister, my older sister Pamela, she's a um, junior at Michigan State University. So um, she has a scholarship here, so she couldn't, you know, pass on that opportunity. So that's why she decided to come back. But for me, and my younger brother, we had to stay with my parents, um, and we went to school there. We went to school in Toluca. Um, and, and that's all because of um, this one really big opportunity we had. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's very different um, for each person because I know a lot of people who got who um, get deported. Um, they like like Amelia said, they just you know go back to their ranch and just start from square square one. Um, and for us, it didn't really go like that. So yeah, so I'm really, we're really grateful that we had like an opportunity like that. But still, it's a, it's a very hard life, to, life to live there. And yeah. Mm -hmm. and to add on to what Lily said, I know that her mother uh, wishes that she was with all of her children. Um, that they. Um, Brian is still in Mexico and then eventually maybe wants to come back to the US to go to school like his other siblings and that they're they're facing a lot of the things that Lily said and had a lot of opportunities and um, I know that she would wish she could be here today and yeah, mm -hmm. in this room and I, I think this also emphasizes how critical it is to, to think beyond the individual who was deported um, often that person is faced with little choice, that person is returning. I think, but as you, as you said, Lulu, sometimes the hardest choices are then made by the family who stays behind. Um, will the family return, will the family stay? And often for mixed status families, sometimes children are, are different immigration statuses, are older, are younger, have different opportunities in the United States, and, and as we can see, some stay and, and some go. Um, so we see that the one single deportation has the power to reshape these families. This, this also then gives us so many opportunities when we, when we think about this family and community unit uh, to intervene and support these folks, right? So again, thinking about the folks who helped with reintegration into, into Mexican society after deportation, um, or the many teachers who supported the children both as they stay and as they go uh, back and forth, support them with money, with food, uh, and with education. You know, and that I think it's good that I invite you to think of, of your roles, whether there's professors or, or students or advocates, um, 
and think of, of your advocacy, not just in stopping in a uh, deportation, but in supporting communities as they evolve uh, and grow afterwards? Right, the reason that uh, Lourdes's family got so much attention was because of her national campaigns and all of the advocates um, along with this family that, that helped th that. Um, most people, it's, it's highly unusual that somebody's greeting you in Mexico, helping you to get a home, right? And actually, I've had uh, um, close contact with Lourdes very recently, and her family is seriously struggling. Um, financially and it makes me very sad to think that so many of us are learning from her bravery her her courage right to come out and be and show what's happened to her and her family um, while they are uh, really struggling so one of the things I wanted to say is that this is not this is not a um, a uh, fundraising event, but if anybody would like to contribute to supporting Lourdes's family back in Mexico, you can see me afterwards, okay? I'll be wandering around. Also, um, my, my email is lsanders dot, uh, at umich.edu, very easy, lsanders, S-A-N-D-E-R-S. Um, as in Bernie and Colonel and Candy. <laughs> and, um, and, um, yeah, I, my phone number uh, is 734-662-3509, if anybody would like to personally contribute to help Lourdes' family. Thank you. Okay, we have another question up. Uh, this is, um, how do we begin to change the conversations on, on immigration policy to better represent the real experiences of people? I think part of um, what I do is trying to do that a little bit and hoping that um, when people look at these photos, hopefully they could personally understand and compa with compassion and empathy, understand what this family is going through on a way deeper level than they would in otherwise just a headline or a story, um, and hopefully even deeper than a campaign. I think that what works together is this type of, uh, this type of thing is the collaboration of all of these things coming together. Um, to really try to change the narrative with Florida, who wants to fight and have her story be told, the community that wants to help her, and the people that are trying to um, to do that. So, yeah. Rachel, can you say a little bit about the kind of response you've gotten as you this work has been exhibited in a couple of different cities? So, mm -hmm. what kind of response has it gotten, positive and negative? What have you heard? Um, I think that. Yeah, so this, this um, came together in a way where I got um, a grant to go, go to Mexico to work on the story. And so through that, this kind of this exhibit came together as well because it was exhibited in Chicago and then also in Stony Brook, New York. So um, uh, Lorda's story has been reaching many, many people. And um, I think it does, her strength shows through, I hope, and shows that she um, she is... Uh, hurting in a lot of ways as well and that um, her kids are her life and she wishes that she could be with them and I think that that's um, the message that she hopes to get out and I think that a lot of people will hopefully gain from this too um, and that that's what she that her fight is is still ongoing as well so I think people um, I hope can understand that from from the photos and from the exhibit and the panel and everything mm -hmm. Sí, me parece mucho muy importante eh, difundir las historias. I believe it is very extremely important to spread the stories. Insistir con los representantes populares. And ellos, to insist with the popular representatives. Ellos conocen de primera mano todas las historias, pero si no se les insiste a esos políticos únicamente van a salir a buscar el voto otra vez y otra vez y otra vez y las políticas de inmigración van a seguir siendo iguales o peores. Politicians know and understand all these stories, but they are only looking to be reelected once again and once again and once again. So they are not looking to distribute or to spread these stories. So we have to do it. Es necesario la presión en esos representantes de la sociedad. 
it is very important and it is a necessity to put pressure into the representatives of our societies. Es necesario bajarlos del pedestal a que se den baños de pueblo. We need to bring them down from the pedestal they're standing so that they can take a bath onto the people the people know. Que conozcan de primera mano lo que está sucediendo. They need, they need to know firsthand what is happening. Gracias. Thank you. Sure. I think the one thing we can uh, also add is it's important to let folks closest to the experience have the microphones more so than those uh, who may be a little bit farther. Um, I think Emilio, Lulu, and thank you, Ivan, also uh, have been good examples of doing that. So seeing as you all uh, come into this work from varying fronts um, and being in um, or being taxed in varying ways, how do you all uh, continue to move forward? What inspires you to find the strength to continue persevering, um, especially when things may seem insurmountable? <laughs> we pull our strength from wherever we can. No tenemos, al menos en mi caso, no tengo reversa para, para regresar a México. We do not have, or at least myself, in my personal case, we don't have a reverse. We cannot go back. I es, cannot go back to Mexico. En diciembre 7 de, de, del año antepasado. ¿Antepasado? Sí. On December 7 of the year before last year, Estuvimos a un minuto de ser deportados. We were one minute away from being deported. ICE no esperó una resolución de la Corte de Apelaciones. ICE did not wait for a resolution from the appeal court. Y fue en el último instante, prácticamente con un pie en México, cuando se paró la deportación. And it was to the last minute. I almost had one foot in Mexico when my deportation was stopped. Reitero, mm -hmm. aplican la ley según les conviene. Once again I say, they apply the laws to their convenience. No podemos regresar, pero afortunadamente, como tocó con, aquí con, con la señorita panelista, hemos tenido la fortuna de que ha habido grupos muy humanistas atrás de nosotros, Está también las asociaciones de periodistas del país. We, can, we cannot go back. However, some of us, like that, this young lady in the panel group with me, we have the support of organizations and, and groups, uh, uh, reporters groups, newspaper reporter groups. Un gran apoyo que actualmente recibo es, de, es por parte de Nice Wallace Fellows. The great support that I currently receive is from Knights. Pero el grueso de las personas deportables están indefensos. However, keep in mind, most of people that are deportable, they are defenseless. Por eso necesitamos crear o fortalecer las ligas, las cadenas de apoyo que existen para los migrantes. And that's why we need to strengthen the uh, support chains for immigrants. Nos vaya bien o nos vaya mal en nuestras peticiones para no ser deportados, whether tenemos que apoyar. Whether it's a positive result or a negative result for our individual immigration cases, we have to support or uh, uh, help other cases. And I can, I can add to um, what keeps, keeps me and I think many of us going um, when things can be frustrating or otherwise seem dark. I remember many of us were there uh, for Lord, this is deportation. So we went to the airport. Uh, we had the wicker banner, banner uh, behind her. And you know, we watched as she walked to, to the metal detector to, to leave, to be deported. Um, you know, we saw her hug the people from the first five, ten years of her life. Um, then she hugged the folks from the next ten years of her life. And then she hugged, I remember seeing her hug the teachers who are going to take care of her children uh, in, 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 
in their mother's absence. Um, and I remember, you know, as she, as she was walking through, all of us were uh, understandably shaking and, and tearing up. Um, and then your mom turned around, Lourdes turned around, and, and she looked at us and she said, La lucha sigue. You know, she said that to us. Um, you know, I just, it, it knocked the wind out of me to, to see someone who was being deported uh, to have the presence of mind to, t to tell us that we needed to keep fighting, right? Um, so, so when I think about like that the movement is frust frustrated or that, 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 that policies aren't gonna change, um, I think about that, that we don't have permission to stop um, because people better than us have, have already been removed. Um, so I, I thank you for, I thank your mom for sharing that moment with us and I think it's one that, that many of us will never forget. In Wicker, we have a little policy, which is celebrate your small victories. Um, when we get, there's been several people where we've been able to stop their deportations or prolong their deportations. We've been able to get people um, some immediate needs that they may have need for, like um, an apartment or, um, you know, just, just a whole plethora of ways in which we've been able to support people. Um, and we celebrate those, those small victories. Um, we also are really, our organization is rooted in collaboration um, in a consensus type of, of restorative justice model for um, running ourselves and um, we elevate the voices of the undocumented community as much as possible. So we are, um, we're rooted in love and I think that's really what keeps us going. What are some of the biggest misconceptions that exist about individuals who are deported? That they're criminals. They're not criminals, by and large. In fact, there's, there's very few, um, you know, the uh, people who have anything more than uh, um, misdemeanors. Um, that are, are necessarily deported. And, and the problem is, is that a lot of people who are deported um, are, have re-entered. So they've been deported before. They come back because their family is here. They're, they're engaged in, the, you know, in their communities. Um, their work is here. And they come back. And then they're, they're, um, if they're caught, they're, they're slapped with a felony. And they are then in a higher criminal category. So be careful about who you're believing, wh who you b believe are criminals, okay? It is a, it is a um, uh, administrative violation to come across a border. It's on par with like a type two misdemeanor, okay? It's not a criminal, uh, it's not a violent or a serious criminal offense. So most of the people that are being called criminals and are, are being, um, you know, uh, the data is showing that they're criminals are people who have committed nonviolent uh, you know, types of uh, uh, civil defenses, or civil offenses, yeah. So one of the main questions that uh, is often asked is how can we support and how can we get involved? Seeing that you all are involved in this work through journalism, research, community organizing, and through personal um, experiences, how can people in their own capacities contribute to equitable ec immigration reform and in supporting people who are vulnerable to this uh, circumstance. I feel like I've talked a lot. Um, well, <laughs> look, get involved in Wicker. There's all sorts of levels. There's all sorts of levels on which you can get involved. If you if you can't really put a lot of time, you can make a donation. We have a Facebook, right? Wicker Facebook. Um, if you, if you, we have volunteers on all levels. If you don't speak Spanish, you can still drive people to a court a case or to an immigration meeting. Um, if you do speak Spanish, you can uh, be an advocate. You, you may, you may want to get involved by carrying our phone and being a first responder um, with with a whole 
um, bunch of support behind you because nobody knows what they're doing at first. You might think, wow, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Well, that's what the training is about and that's what the support, the levels of support that we've put into place are about. So we would love to have uh, more people involved and there's always, there's always opportunity in, in, um, within, within our organization. So you can go to our Facebook. Um, anything else? Any other ways to connect? Yeah, yeah. I also want to say that I think there's a really important policy conversation that we want to have in the United States about immigration policy. Um, that doesn't mean the conversation about immigration policy shouldn't be everybody who wants to come to the U.S. should come to the U.S. It also shouldn't be nobody who wants to come to the U.S. should come because we have to keep everything here for people who are here already. Um, so there are a lot of, lot of options in between. And instead, I think we often sort of default to the one that is the sexiest or the one that is the most um, discouraging or the one that is um, the most polarizing. Um, let's think about, let's you educate yourselves about the variety of ways in which the United States has organized immigration, other countries have organized immigration, and really think about ways where we can meet the needs of the United States, which include the economic growth that immigrants can bring, um, while also maintaining an immigration policy that doesn't require some people to break the law because there's no other way for them to come. Um, we've got about f five minutes left, and so um, maybe we can take one more question. Uh, so lastly, from your personal perspective, how should we reform immigration policy? It's tough to end on that one. <laughs> 30 Aquí los que la tienen que reformar son los políticos y la sociedad. The people that have to transform the, the policies are the politicians. Pero ellos deben tener la presión y el apoyo de la sociedad. But they have to receive pressure and support from the society. Y aunque les guste a unos la idea y a otros no. And even if some people like the idea and some other people do not like the idea. Se tiene que buscar la forma pacífica de que nuestros políticos entiendan lo que pretende la sociedad y que se pongan a trabajar. We need to find a peaceful manner or a peaceful way for our politicians to understand what a society needs and what society wants so that they can start working on the real things. I think not um, being aware, not creating divisions for worthy and unworthy uh, immigrants is really important. What we see right now is our president willing to trade the wall for DACA. And um, we've been here before. We've seen our community split. And, and folks, especially folks uh, with DACA, um, don't want to do this. Often, these are just two fabricated categories that we make. Uh, to push a particular political platform when the reality is what we're asking is um, do we want to allow our 25 to 30 year old undocumented immigrants to be deported or to funnel more people into the desert where they're going to die, right? These are not the choices we should be making when it comes to uh, planning p immigration policy. So I think it's good both for our politicians and for us to be aware of these categories that don't naturally exist and we need to fight them and see our community as a whole. Yeah, I'd say watch out for watch out for what Trump's intentions really are, which is to um, change chain migration, what he's calling chain migration, which is basically family uh, mi migration or family Im immigration, um, to you know immig uh, allowing people who are highly educated, the uh, quote best and brightest, right, to come into the country, and so he's really looking to shift a very long time value that we've had in our immigration system of allowing families to bring other family members over, even if they're unskilled or ha have less skill than people who are um, supposedly, you know, highly educated. So watch that because he really wants to change our legal 
immigration system. And we've had a whole lot, we have a whole lot of good ideas about what some comprehensive immigration reform will look like. It looks like helping the DACA kids to be able to, youth to be able to stay and their families. It, it, cre it would create a um, pathway to citizenship for people who have been here for a long time. It, it allows people who want to come and work here uh, to work here. Um, so um, there's, there, we don't need a wall, that's for sure. And so just watch for those, those um, key elements of a good immigration reform. Okay. Um, is there anything that anyone would like to say just that to close off? Sí. Yo, yo coincido con el señor López. I, in, I am in agreement with Mr. López. En algo muy importante. In something that is very important. Para muchas personas, regresar a México significa in una muerte inmediata. To many people, going back to Mexico represents or means an immediate death. Y lo digo por mí. And I'm speaking about myself. Yo tuve problemas con los militares. I got problems with the military. Actualmente los militares están en las embajadas, en los consulados, en el servicio de inmigración. Currently, uh, the army is located in the embassies, in the consulates, in all immigration services. En todas las oficinas de gobierno en México están los militares. In all the government offices in Mexico, the militaries are there. Yo entré en un shock cuando nos dijeron que nos iban a deportar, porque de antemano sabía que el consulado se iba a enterar, y el consulado nos iba a entregar a una oficina de servicios migratorios. When I was told that I was going to be deported, I knew that the consulate was going to deliver me to the immigration services, and I was in shock. I have a nervous breakdown. Y eso obviamente representaba nuestra desaparición. That obviously represented that we were going to disappear. Desafortunadamente, en México actualmente, el nuevo gobierno está haciendo uso de los militares para labores de seguridad. No ha cambiado nada en México. And unfortunately, the new government in Mexico is co still uses the military for security purposes. Things have not changed in Mexico. Ahora el problema es más grave. The problem is even worse. Y cuidar de esos casos en donde la vida, en donde las cabezas están bajo la guillotina, Yo creo que sería un, una gran oportunidad para muchos de salvar vidas. And we have a great Gracias. opportunity to take care of all those cases where lives are in danger. It's a great opportunity to save lives. Gracias. Thank you. Um, let me just thank this amazing panel and thank you too for asking such great, interesting questions. <laughs>